Glad to have our kids in here tonight. Isn't that a blessing? Man, a sharp looking bunch of kids. Hey, how are you? You want to what? You want to say something? You'll say, hey, pastor. <laughs> All right. It's uh, so good to see you tonight. And y'all, I tell you, from the looks of these kids, y'all are wonderful parents, I'll tell you. You did good. And we're going to pray for them. And uh, I think they're going to go ahead. Y'all ready to sing? Did I do good? Did I get everybody up here? Okay. Huh? Mommy is right over there. Yeah. That's not mommy, no. All right, go ahead.
that you may think that you are not important, that God doesn't need a thing you have to offer, but if you are his child, he has something very special for you to do. Trust him and you'll find his strength and wisdom to lead others on into his kingdom. Right where you are is right where he wants to use you. Good job, boys and girls. That was great. Praise the Lord. Well, it's our turn to sing, so let's all stand together and let's grab a hymn book. Hymn number 531. We'll sing All Hell, the Power of Jesus' Name. And as we begin to sing this hymn, the choir, the adult choir, I'd like to ask them to come on up into the choir loft. Hymn number 531, All Hell, the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's sing it out on that first verse. All Hell, the Power of Jesus' singing tonight you may be seated pray for the choir as we sing if God is for me
Amen. Yeah. Thank you, choir. Now it's our turn to sing again. Let's all stand together and we'll turn to hymn number 369. Hymn number 369, and we'll sing The Comforter Has Come. Oh, spread the tidings round. out as one big choir.
remain standing for the offering. Fellas, come forward if you will. Once again, thank you for being here. Didn't the kids do great? They did good. Don't choir did good. And we have a wonderfully talented church. And, uh, you know, I've seen churches that have talent, but, um, you know, sometimes you wonder. I, don't, I know you've never done this because you're more spiritual than the pastor, but I've wondered how spiritual they are singing. But, you know, I don't think about that here. My spirit bears witness with them, and, and uh, I praise the Lord for that. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, you know, talent and the touch of God are two different things. And that's good when you can have both. <laughs> and uh, we do in so many ways. And I thank the Lord for that. And Brother Randy, thank you for being here tonight. You pray for us for the offering. And you give as the Lord leads you tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for the comforter, Lord, your Holy Spirit. God, just thank you so much. Lord, we pray for this offering. And a gift and a giver, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Bibles tonight, <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number three, Proverbs chapter number three, and then um, Acts chapter nine, Proverbs three, and Acts chapter number nine, and uh, well, it's been a good day, hope you had a good day, and I thank the Lord for his blessings and his goodness, and I got to preach twice today already, and I'm, I'm excited about that. And uh, had a good time preaching to the young people over gospel light, middle school and high school. And, uh, well, the Christian school kids gets a bad rap, but I'm going to tell you, they listened so good and uh, paid attention, good altar call, and uh, that was a blessing. And uh, thank you to those teachers. We probably got uh, nine or ten-ish. Mitchell, how many we got over there? Nine or ten-ish. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, we got nine or ten-ish teachers over there. I don't know who that ten-ish one is, but um, uh, we got we got several. And uh, then we we probably got we probably got forty or fifty kids over there. Uh, but you know, I tell you, I, we love we love all of our kids. Amen. We don't we don't promote one school over another school, and we don't promote one kid over another kid. And I'll tell you this, you, who, who, you know, where, where, what schools do you like? I like the autonomy of parents. That's what I like. That's Bible. It's not my job to tell you where, to, where to, what to do with your kids' education. Now, if you want to ask my opinion, I'll give it to you. But you, you are in charge of that, gentlemen. Y'all, you're in charge. So whatever you do, I want you to know this. I support you. I'm for you. And uh, I'll go to I'll go to public school and pray and help and eat lunch and do. I'll go to Christian school and do that. If you got a homeschool co-op and you want to meet at the library, I'll keep them come there. I'm for you. I'm for you trying to educate your kids in the best way you see fit. 
I'm for that. And any pastor that, that leans one way or another, it's really not my job to do that. Because I now, I'm going to tell you, they're with you more than they're with teachers in church. So it's your job to raise your kids, not the schools anyway. So, I, But I'm for you. If you homeschool, I'm for you. If you public school, I'm for you. If you Christian school, I'm for you. If you want to just lay, let them lay out and go fishing and hunting, I'm for that too. <laughs> I'm really for that. <laughs> I'm just teasing just a tad bit there, all right? But let's bow for prayer. And the gentleman going to sing for us. And um, you have your Bibles ready, and we'll get right into it. Father, again, thank you for this night. I pray you'll bless now. This song, I pray you'll use it for your honor and your glory. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When the angry winds are blowing and the storm is all around, oh, how sweet it is in knowing that a refuge I have found. I stand upon, upon the blessed holy rock of ages and say, This rock is Christ my Savior, my soul he will defend. Trusting daily in his favor, on his promise I depend. I stand upon the blessed holy rock of ages and say within his shelter I will be. Proverbs chapter number 3, verses 5 through 6, and in Acts chapter number 9, and we're talking about, and Brother Mike, give me a little, it feels a little, um, not enough mantra up here, or body or something, maybe too much top end again. I don't know why I always say that. We need to get the, I don't know, you, you may not even be able to do anything about it. I just know what I, what I'm here and if you can't do nothing about it just tell me preacher we i can't do nothing about that so you can say it all you want to but i'm not going to change anything back here um proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 and you know those verses very familiar to you uh, trust in the lord with all thine heart lean not unto thy own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths now we do believe, and, and there is, uh, me and Brother Dwight had this conversation, and, and even before that, I had, I had these notes together um, and actually got another book from him. It was very helpful. Um, but they, there are some different ideas about God's will, and we're going to talk about it. Now, we're going through the book that I mentioned before, and uh, there's a chapter on God's will, and that's where we were. Matter of fact, I had it ready last week uh, before Brother Johnson was here, and I uh, called on him to preach for us, and I'm glad he did a wonderful job, and his family, we're praying for them. Uh, but th there are some myths that, that he lists here in the book, and, uh, but I want to I wanna start out by saying I do believe, and, and, and there's different terms when you say will of God, we know it's not his will that any should perish. We know that. We know that there are things that, that God has established that his, that is his sovereign will, 
through his omnipotence, for instance, um, you know, he, he, it's his will to sustain the earth. By him, everything is sustained. And so there are certain things that are fixed that, that happen. They, they are God's will. Now, with people, it's not his will that any should perish, but there is a part of that that depends on the exercising of our own will, our will. We don't believe we're robots. We have a free will. And don't let that scare you. Our will does not catch God by surprise. He knows what we're going to do every time. But that doesn't dictate to us what we do. We still have a, a choice to exercise that will. But it's when I say will of God, let's, let's cut to the chase here. That means a does God have a specific definite plan for your life? And I believe the answer to that is yes. As we discussed, I, there are those that, that say no. You know, basically we're just creatures of chance and uh, really God doesn't have, but I believe God does have a will for your life. Now, we'll get into some other aspects about that and just, just maybe a little bit on this one, maybe the next lesson we'll have two on this. Um, but here are the myths. The first one he lists is the map myth. And that is the myth that God's gonna give you a roadmap for his will for you. Now, he does give us his word, but as far as spelling out exactly what he wants you to do every step of the way all throughout your life, he doesn't do that. Now, uh, the will of God is not a roadmap. It is a relationship. You need to get that. Because some, some kids and even middle-aged and on up in the sunset years will think that, um, you know, God's, God's will is, is a roadmap. And I just got to find that roadmap, whip it out here and look and see. It is a relationship. So the, the idea is this, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you're going to know specifics about what he wants you to do. The further away you get, the more dingy that's going to look. And the more unclear it is what God wants for your life. Now, there are certain things that we know he wants for us. Again, he wants everybody to be saved. They're not going to be saved, but he wants everybody to be saved. It's not his will that any should perish. So he's, he wants us to be saved. He, he wants people to go to church, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves. It's not a, you don't have to pray about that. You don't have to try to discern, I'm discerning God's will about church. Hogwash. If you're discerning between a tree stand and a corporate gathering, you're highly misled. I've heard people tell me that, you know, I can meet with God in tree stand. Well, sure you can. That's not church. You can stay out there all day till you grow mold on over you, moss, whatever. It's fine. But don't say that's church. Like John Denver, you you know, get out on the mountains and, and that, that ain't church either. It's pretty. But it's not church. And so... There are certain things that is his will and you know that. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's God's will that every creature has a preacher, a witness, somebody to tell them. So you don't have to ask, should I witness for you today? It's not a good question because he's already established the point. Yes. Like you don't, you shouldn't have to pray Lord, if you want me to go to Monday night visitation or Saturday morning visitation, you show me in a sign. He's already showed you a bunch of signs. They're called verses. Amen. So some things are his, they're already predetermined. They're his will. He wants you to do it. There are other parts that you may not know. So how do you, how, so he lays a roadmap. No, it's from relational conversations, communication with the Father that you find 
Who knows, who knows more what the father, like even on an earthly level, who knows more about what mama, what colors mama likes and what mama likes than anybody else? I can tell you who. Whoever hangs around her more. The, the son or daughter that calls her every day, they probably know. They're the ones that know why they're, they're around. So, so the, the will of God, again, it's not just some Magna Carta. It's not just some document that you get when you get saved and here when you get off of this. No, it's a relational process. And you find out more about God's will for your life when you find out more about him. It's through the relationship. Number two, the misery myth. If I do the will of God, it's going to be painful. Let me just tell you, if you don't do the will of God, it's going to be painful. So the, the idea that God is some kind of celestial killjoy, that's a falsehood. God's not up in heaven trying to, to squash your fun. But, you know, if, I, if, I, if, if the Lord, if I say I'll do anything and, and you want me to do or anywhere, anytime, any place, uh, any cost, I'll end up a missionary in some, the deepest part of Africa is what everybody says, you know. Uh, maybe I'll be eaten by can cannibals and, and uh, nobody will know I'm, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, some people are afraid of God. That's why you don't understand the will of God. The will of God is, is disclosed through a relationship. And so if you miss or you have the wrong idea of God's just up there dictating everything you do and he's mad about it and uh, he's just trying to make your life miserable, you've got it all backwards because you need to go back to the relational part. It's a relationship. The will of God is garnered. It's disclosed as you get closer to him. And so it's not, it's not some, some misery trip, the misery myth. And number three, the missionary myth, God's will is just for a certain class of people. There's some people who think the only people God has a will for are missionaries and pastors. That's not true. That's not true. Um, God, you know, they think God doesn't call ordinary people. Not true. That was a good song, by the way, for that. God has a, a plan for the evangelist, but guess what? He has a plan for the secretary too. God has a plan for the preacher, but he also has a plan for the plumber. God has a plan for every believer. He has a plan for the Bible teacher. He has a plan for the banker. He has a plan for your life. All of us. So don't say, I, I hope these missionaries sense the call of God on their life. Well, I hope you do. Because God's got a call on every one of us, a purpose, a plan. And uh, report to duty no matter where you are, who you are. It's your job to report to duty. So the missionary myth, number four, the miracle myth, uh, pretty much you have to do something dramatic in order for uh, you to know the will of God. But in 1 Kings 19, 11 and 12, you can read that when you get home. He, he, he didn't come in the, in the big parts of uh, the, the earthquake and, and all the chatter. He came in the still, small voice. That's how he heard him. Still small voice. It wasn't like what he thought. It's not in the, in the wind, not in the earthquake, it, not in the fire, but it's still small voice. And uh, most people won't, won't, want that to happen. Uh, but really, if you want to find out God's will for your life, there's a still small voice. And um, turn over to Proverbs 4. You're already right there. Turn over to verse 18. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So it's walking in the light that God gives you. Doing the will of God is walking in the light that he gives you. Number five, the mystic myth. Now this, this is a very debatable topic and I'm gonna give you my take on it. And you, we don't have time to discuss. We could discuss this all night and wake up or not even wake up. We could go from here to work in the morning and not be done. And I know you don't want to do that. So we're not going to do that. 
But there are those who say, when I'm young, God had a plan for my life and I didn't do it. He wanted me to be, be a missionary and then it, it's too late for me. It's too late for me. Now, th- th- there, who's right on that, Pastor? Who's right on that? I believe this. Can you miss God's will? Yes. Are there, are there forfeitures if you do? In other words, are there things you could potentially lose or miss by missing God's will? Help me, church. Yes. Yes. But I'm glad that Joel 2.25 is in the Bible. I'm going to read it to you. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. He said, I'm going to restore. Now, while, so if you, if you miss God's will, and, and this is where me and Dwight could probably talk for all night, and we did talk a little bit the other day about this. So what happens if you do? Like, you can miss it, we know that. We know that. And there, there's consequences which will be, will accompany missing God's will. So what if another party misses it for you? Then is it over? I don't think so. I don't think so. When, when something doesn't go right, wherever you are at that moment, you have another choice to make. You do God's will from where you are. Because really, there can be nothing done about past decisions, except you've already lived with the consequences now, there are some consequences that disqualify you from certain things serving God. Yes. But wherever you are, do God's will today. I don't believe that, that one strike on that, and because that's not what the Bible teaches. And I believe that where, where you are, you say, Pastor, I knew, uh, for instance, y'all remember when Brother Bowden was here the other, the other night? I made reference to it one time. Brother Roscoe Babbin was here preaching. Do y'all remember that? And for those who wasn't here, he was talking about somebody that he knew he should have witnessed to. And, uh, and he didn't. And a person died. Most likely, unless something changed between the time he seen him and the time they took their last breath, most likely went to hell. Now, he's gonna have their blood on his hands. He said that, not me. So he missed God's will in that instant. So tomorrow when he sees somebody else and the Holy Spirit prompts him to witness, he just says, well, I don't need to do that because I've already blown it. No, 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 no. 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 Do today what God is telling you to do. And the only way you're going to know that is to be far away from it. No, I'm going to see some of you are sleeping. Is to be close to him. So you, you've got you've to have a relational, you've got to be close to know the will of God. And so if, if, you, if you blew something years ago, now, it may not be that again, but to say God has nothing for you, I don't think the Bible teaches that. Now, if it's, if, it's, if it's just blatant sin and disobedience, disregard for the word, that's a whole different, I'm not talking about that. If, if, if a man gets disqualified for the ministry, he needs to go sell cars or insurance. Get on out. Don't go down the road and start another church. Don't come and say you're in the helps ministry and all that. No, just get out. Come on now. Well, God can't never use him. Sure he can, just not in that place position. No other church. See, that's what we've been doing these days in this culture. If they mess up in one church, just call down there and recommend them to another. Hogwash. 
No. Now, does it mean he can't ever live for Jesus? No, nope, not at all. It just means he's not in that capacity. There are things you forfeit when you get out of the will of God. But there is still a will for you until God calls you home for today. And I believe that. I believe you need to find it and do it. So the missed it myth and then uh, if, if, if you've missed God's plan, let God reprogram you wherever you are. Get close to him and follow what it is he wants you to do. And then, then the, the, mystery, the mystery myth, like it's some kind of, uh, you know, treasure hunt. That's not true. God's not trying to blindfold you and hide his will um, from you. He wants to direct your steps Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He wants, to, he wants to direct them. He wants to give us direction. Uh, it's not some kind of, um, you know, mystery about what he, what he wants you to do. And so in Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus, uh, verses 1 and 2. Turn over there to Acts chapter 9, and I'm going to read just a, a verse or two, and we'll continue next week. But Acts chapter number 9. Verses one and two, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, the Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So he was taking Christians, the people of the way, taking them prisoner and bringing them to Jerusalem, some put in prison, some put to death. And then you know the story, verse three. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse six, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Woo. He just got, I mean, here the scales are going to fall off his eyes. He got saved, and the first thing he says, what do you want me to do? God has a, God has a will. First, you need to find out who are, who's the Lord. <laughs> who are you, Lord, he said. And then you need to find out what does he want you to do. Everybody has, God has a will. for If you're breathing, he has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. So quit thinking, there's some of you tonight that are thinking right now that God somehow, just like the pick and kickball, they forgot about you. He's not forgot about, he has a plan for you. But sometimes it's, it's true, we get so far away from him that we don't know what his plan is. Or we got, we're too busy doing our plan, we don't need his. You're gonna get in trouble like that. So why don't you pray tonight God, I know you have a plan for me. Give me a desire to know and do your will. I don't think for one minute there's such a problem with people not knowing God's will for their life. I don't believe that for a minute. People go around acting like, well, I just don't know what the Lord wants me to do. I don't believe it. The problem is we know and just don't want to do it. We know what God wants out of our life but we choose not to do it. So tonight on this first part, let's pray and say, God, I know you have a plan for me. Lord, help me to desire your plan, not my plan, your plan for my life and be willing to do it because we'll see that was an important part of God revealing his will. You gotta be willing to do it. Lord, who are you? I'm assuming you know the Lord tonight. Now ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And God will show you. It's not always, it doesn't always fall in line with what you're doing either. We need to be sensitive to what God wants. Father, thank you for this night. Lord, thank you for all that we've enjoyed here tonight. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless now the remainder of our time together. And Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, I know you have a plan for them and I pray that you'll fulfill it. Lord, I pray you would make us all conformable to your image, the image of your dear son. 
in Christ.